Hi everyone. Good afternoon. I'm glad I stayed in the room for these last 20 minutes. Um, yes, my name is Rima Lefari. It's a pleasure to be here today. Thanks for inviting me. Uh, I'm an assistant professor at ETH Zurich. I mainly do not do data science, um, but apply to monic analysis. But today I'll show you something that I hope is interesting to you too. So my question is, are machine learning algorithms, and here I mainly ne mean deep learning algorithms, um, are they robust? Because I come from inverse problems, we're interested in seeing whether algorithms are stable. Do I need to click myself? Yes, OK. Yes, OK. Um, OK, so um, maybe you've heard of this in, um, in the literature about adversarial examples, adversarial attacks for deep learning algorithms. I'll talk a little bit about this in image classification. I'll show you something that we have done in this context. And uh, I would also like to touch on um, a problem that is not image classification, but actually to solve inverse problems, so a regression problem, um, using deep neural networks, and whether we can speak about robustness in that context too. And um, yeah, I should mention this is really joint work with Giovanni Alberti, we were postdocs uh, at ETH back in 2015 at the same time, and we wanted to find a project together, so this is what we came up with. And Tandri Gauxson is my PhD student at ETH. So what are adversarial examples in the context of image classification? We heard already today a little bit about image classification, um, where in the supervised learning setting, we have trained an algorithm, and now we want to feed it with unseen images, and it should actually find uh, objects or classify objects correctly in that image. They are really state of the art, uh, deep neural networks for image classification um, because of their high success rate. I mean, they, they, are, they beat everything else. Uh, that's why they are so popular, but the robustness question is not so clear. And this is what we uh, talk about when we talk about adversarial attacks. So this was actually discovered almost a decade ago um, that there is this vulnerability of image classifiers of deep neural networks um, with respect to these attacks. So let me just set the stage here. Uh, we have uh, the image space. We think of images as vectors. And the grayscale, so P here is the number of pixels. In the grayscale scenario, we would think of vectors of length P, or in the RGB, it would be vectors of length 3P. And a classifier is just a mapping that for each vector gives you a label. Here we have L classes. And we implement this typically with a function f, a mapping f that uh, gives you like a vector of likelihoods, and we will choose the most likely class or label. So this is how we implement it typically. And what are adversarial examples? Well, there is no rigorous mathematical definition I can give you because it, it actually relies on visual inspection, what you would call an adversarial example and what you would not call an adversarial example. Um, but in principle, it means that I have a correctly classified image. I add a small perturbation so that visually you wouldn't see a difference or almost no difference. You would still think it's a cat if it was a cat to begin with. But now it's, um, the algorithm just incorrectly classifies it as something else. And so typically, uh, we would think of the difference between these images as being small in some LP norm. So this is the perturbation R. All right? And these adversarial examples, they don't just come up like this in nature, but we have attack algorithms that do this. So uh, here, you know, especially if you have security-sensitive applications, you don't want attackers to be able to fool your classifier, right? And this is... Uh, what is done with these adversarial attacks to actually show. And not only do they come up sometimes, but actually, you know, they're able to fool in 99% of the cases and so on. So this is really something we should worry about. So here's a, maybe a challenge to spot the difference here. This is like a typical adversarial example where on the left, um, this uh, ptarmigan is correctly classified. You add a small perturbation that you see in the middle and it's incorrectly classified as a partridge. So what happened here? What happened here is that um, there was this algorithm, right, that did it. And what we thought then is, OK, suppose I can now give you an algorithm that is stable with respect to small LP perturbations. Am I done then? Should I be happy with that algorithm or not? 
And this is what I want to tell you a little bit about here when I say beyond norm-constrained perturbations. So is it sufficient to have an algorithm that is, small, uh, that is stable under small additive perturbations that I just showed you, so that the picture in the above cannot happen, the, uh, uh, before that I showed you cannot happen? Or are there other invariants to account for? And if, if you think about images, then you would immediately say, no, there are other invariants I should account for too, right? Small translations or rotations or deformations, they are not small in LP necessarily, but you want them to be invariant, these classifiers. Um, so here's an example of a correctly classified image as a red fox. And what we did is, this is not a perturbation, Okay, uh, I will tell you in a second what this is, but it's now this adversarial attack, what it did is to come up with a very similar image, and now it's classified as a shopping cart. Um, and what we actually did was to create deformations. So we're not introducing new pixel values, we're just taking the pixel values we have at our, in this image, and we're just moving them around, wiggling around a little bit and see what the algorithm will do. And to think about deformations, we actually need to model the images as continuous objects. So for us, uh, we said, OK, they should be square integrable functions on the unit square. And I want to think about uh, here now very specific deformations, there are other deformations you can think of. So what we're deforming is actually the, um, the positions okay, of, the, of the pixels. So we're moving around those pixels. So, um, what we're, so this deformed image x tau it has a vector field applied to the spatial variable. And a vector field will be admissible if it doesn't, it shouldn't, of course, move out of the unit square. So this is a requirement that we have. Now, the distance, uh, it doesn't make sense to speak of the distance of x and x tau, right? That might be large. If you just think of moving the pixels a little bit, you will create a very large norm, uh, possibly but we want to rather speak about the size of this adversarial example in terms of the size of the vector field. So if it's a small vector field, we will say that it's probably visually indistinguishable. And that's what we call an adversarial deformation. Okay, so this is what we did. We wanted to say, okay, let's not only think about perturbations, small additive perturbations, let's also think about possible other things. Here is an example, an adversarial deformation. Okay, so we will, th we will say that we have an adversarial deformation if you give me a budget epsilon and I'm not allowed to go over this budget for the norm of my vector field. Um, and I will try to find a deformed image so that the algorithm is fooled, it misclassifies. And to do that, what we did was to solve a root finding problem. So we say, okay, um, suppose the correct, of course, it only makes sense to do this for a correctly classified image, right? So to begin with, we have a correctly classified image that we call X here. The correct label is L. And I have a target label. I want to fool the classifier to think that it's label K instead of label L, okay? And then I can think of a binary classifier. So I can discard all the other labels. I don't care about all the other labels. I only think about the labels K and L. And what I want my classifier to do is, instead of thinking that it's that uh, L is more likely, K should become more likely, okay? So this function, little f, that I define here, to begin with, it's negative, right? Because L is the more likely label. Now I want a deformed image, x tau, so that f of x tau is positive. I want to kind of push it over the decision boundary with a hopefully small vector field, so this is the goal. And, uh, well, to do that, we define a function g that is the concatenation of this f with the deformation operator of x. What is the deformation operator of x? Well, it maps the, the, the vector field, any vector field tau, to its deformed image. And this is the algorithm. Um, again, this is our goal. We want to misclassify um, the deformed image with label k. Uh, we think of this function g that I just introduced, and we wanted to push. We want to push it over the decision boundary. So we want g of tau to become positive, uh, whereas we started uh, with g of zero being negative. And uh, we do this uh, by linear approximation. Here, of course, we need to assume a few, a few things. But suppose we can do this linear approximation. We have the Frechet derivative. We do a linear approximation uh, around the zero. Um, 
deformation or the zero vector field. And um, what we want to do is we want, oops, we want to push this um, over zero, right? So what, this is what we want to solve, right? If you look at this, this is what we want to solve. We want to find the vector field tau that will do this for us, that will push over to the other side of the scale. And this is not uniquely solvable. We choose to do it in the least squares sense. Some, I mean, you can skip the details here. Um, but we do this iteratively until we reach uh, the, the, the label that we want. So until we like, push it over the decision boundary. So here's uh, an example again, uh, what I showed you at the beginning. Now you can see what's happening actually. What's happening is uh, I deformed my image with this vector field. Um, and now the uh, algorithm, algorithm thinks it's a shopping cart, not a red fox anymore. So here's a close up. And uh, of course, if I have a fixed budget, what it will not do, the algorithm, is to move very similar pixel values around, right? So if I'm in an area where nothing's happening, right, then it will not try to move around pixel values. This is really a waste of the budget. So it will really do a lot around edges. All right. Um, and now I want to take my very last minutes to tell you a little bit about an ongoing project that we have. Um, which, I mean, right, I mean, we come from inverse problems and we usually employ classical algorithms to, um, so regularization algorithms to solve inverse problems, but now really deep learning has entered the field and people are seeing great results using deep learning for solving complicated inverse problems. So beyond, you know, um, classification problems but really regression problems where the output should not be a label, but the output should actually be a reconstruction. Um, and, well, uh, maybe a, a very prominent example for an inverse problem is um, or, or in general medical imaging applications like magnetic resonance imaging uh, or sparse CT. So uh, methods that are classically hard to solve but uh, are uh, often solved with compressed sensing algorithms. So here what we have is we have not enough data essentially. So in MRI what you have is you have sampled Fourier transform data um, if you have an underdetermined system, you actually don't have enough measurements, and then you make additional assumptions on the, on the solution so that you can solve. So what you say is, okay, um, let's model my, uh, my reconstruction that I want to get to be sparse in some basis, for example, sparse in wavelets or so. And this is uh, what you can see here. So what you need is a regularization. You can't just solve this, but you have to impose additional knowledge on your um, solution, okay? Um, but nowadays, really, uh, deep learning has entered the picture, and there has been this uh, work here by Antun and co-authors in 2020 who uh, actually challenged the whole thing and said, well, look, actually, uh, we can create adversarial features, let's say. I don't know if they called it like this, but, uh, oops, sorry. Adversarial features, um, we can fool the reconstruction algorithm as well. So we should be very worried about the stability of these algorithms. Um, then came a different line of work by Gensel et al. in, well, rather recently. And they have a different perspective. They say, no, this is not what we should do because if you think of, if you look at the two images and you compare them, there's, the difference is small in LP and this is, this is the benchmark that we also use for classical algorithms. So why should we be so unfair to deep learning and you know, uh, want more of deep learning than we would for classical algorithms? And um, what, what we then, I mean, yeah, so actually we started working on this um, before Gensel et al came out and w our, our goal was to see actually what about the classical algorithms? Because we never thought about fooling classical algorithms. We never did this before. We always said it's stable in L2, it's stable in some norm, uh, so we're happy with it. And now deep learning has all these attacks. So you know, should we think about attacks for classical algorithms too? And if you do this, uh, so for example, for total variation minimization, then you see that um, under some circumstances, you also get artifacts that you can create. So you can also, uh, push the classifier here, uh, not the classifier, the, the reconstruction algorithm here. Um, so I think there needs to be some discussion here about the invariance that we want to see also in, in medical imaging 
and uh, in general about attacking classical, uh, classical algorithms. You don't get this straightforwardly, but if you um, force the algorithm to do localized artifacts, then you see something. And this is a little bit what we also did for uh, the deformations where we said it's not about being small in L2 or LP only. Um, and with that, I would like to thank you for your attention.